Welcome back to the program. Well, if you feel like you've been left out in this election campaign, consider the plight of Indigenous Australians. There's been very little talked about, offered to them at all through this campaign. More from Tony Abbott, as it turns out, than from Labor and Kevin Rudd. We did try and try and try to bring together the Indigenous Affairs Minister, Jenny Macklin, and the Shadow Minister, Nigel Scullion, to discuss Indigenous Affairs in this election campaign, and particularly in this final week. But no luck, unfortunately. Uh, fortunately, we have got our Indigenous Affairs correspondent, Dan Borsha, here with me in the studio. Dan, great to have you here. And also in Canberra for us this afternoon, Justin Muhammad is the chair of the National Aboriginal Community Controlled Health and Kirsty Parker, the co-chair of the National Congress of Australia's First Peoples. Welcome to you uh, as well. Dan, I want to start by getting you to tell us uh, in broad terms what has at least been offered from the parties in this campaign. Well, David, you're absolutely right. It's been quite a lacklustre campaign when it comes to Indigenous affairs. So far, we've seen very little from the Labor Party. They've announced $777 million over three years to continue uh, ongoing health programs, within, particularly within the Northern Territory, and that's in the frame of Stronger Futures. And we've also seen uh, an announcement around spending, uh, particularly for getting people into the back into the workplace there in the Northern Territory. But you're right, it's been really the coalition where we've seen the bulk of announcements that began quite early on in the campaign where Mr Abbott visited Nullumboy announced that he'd have a new advisory committee which would be chaired by the former ALP uh, President Warren Mundine. We also heard, followed on from that that uh, Indigenous Affairs would be moved into Prime Minister and Cabinet and that the, it would now be a, a standalone portfolio for Senator Nigel Scullion. Uh, following on from that, Mr Abbott announced that he'd review all of the spending that goes into workplace training across the country and that Fortescue Medals CEO Andrew Forrest would be chairing that which uh, must... You point out he's done a lot of work in this area Andrew Forrest. Absolutely and it's important to note now that he did set up Generation One which has the the goal of uh, getting some 60,000 Indigenous Australians into employment uh, as soon as possible so uh, Mr Abbott has also announced an additional five million dollars spend there. We've also seen a, a smaller announcement about Empower Communities which is an initiative of Noel Pearson up in Cape York, which is, uh, he says, a, a new way of bringing people together to look at sustainable ways into the future. Of course, we've seen from the Greens uh, a big push around justice reinvestment, which I think we'll probably get into a little bit around incarceration rates, uh, and all of the parties uh, continuing their bipartisan approach to constitutional recognition of First Australians. All right, well, let's just have a listen to um, a bit, the bit from Tony Abbott on... Uh, Andrew Forrest, the efforts he's making and how he wants to provide more resource for him to continue this work. Here he was. I want us to walk this path as brothers, as people of like mind but different political traditions. And of course we saw uh, this was the announcement ar around Warren Mundine chairing that very uh, specific advisory group which has been announced uh, by the opposition leader of course. Uh, it was suggested that this panel be a temporary panel however Mr Abbott says that he probably wants this to be in a more ongoing uh, capacity. Let's have a little bit of a listen to what uh, Mr Mundine said in response. Council. Okay. Do, actually I think, do we have um, the Warren Mundine uh, clip there of? No. Anyway, look. Let's let's. We, we heard the announcement being that he's essentially going to play this ongoing, overarching role of reviewing mm. um, government policy. Um, well, let's bring in now perhaps uh, Kirsty Parker for your thoughts on this. Warren Mundine, we know, former Labor Party president, now wants to work with Tony Abbott uh, to oversee or review the approach here. Is this a good idea? Is he the right person for this sort of job? Um, that's a matter, I guess, for uh, a coalition government, and they seem to have made some decisions around that. And Warren's been very open about, um, you know, his, uh, I guess, um, influence across the political spectrum, and has said that he will work with whoever is in in government. Indeed, that is the approach that all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander organisations, I believe, will take. In that, um, you know, the challenges facing our communities are large, and we are going to have to work. Uh, with an incoming government of whatever um, political persuasion it will be. In terms of the uh, Indigenous Advisory Council that um, Tony Abbott has announced Warren Mundine will head, um, you know, this is not new. Um, it's not new that uh, uh, Mr Abbott has, uh, you know, had a relationship um, with uh, particular communities and particular people, and that's not 
not so much a problem. We would expect that any politician um, worth their salt would be speaking with a range of people, but that's the key. It needs to be a range of people. There are many um, uh, uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who have ex expertise across a range and, of areas. And is Tony Abbott doing that? Is he talking to a range, or do you think he's uh, limiting his advice to... Oh, in terms of you? his uh, public pronouncements, there's certainly been a limit um, to the people that he's flagged that he will talk to. Of course, we're very scant on detail, even on the Indigenous Advisory Council. Mm. We know that Warren will head it, but we don't know the rest of the makeup of it. And certainly from uh, my perspective as a co-chair of the National Congress of Australia's First People, we would expect that any incoming government, um, coalition, ALP, um, would certainly... Uh, uh, respect the place of the National Congress as a representative body um, and people that are chosen by our people themselves. And Kirsty, just on that point, there's been some criticism of Mr Mundine over the last couple of days and particularly this model of having a hand-picked advisory at council. Of course, this, the, that was some of the criticism around ATSEC and then the Indigenous uh, group that, pres that followed on from that. How do you think that this model can actually work? Um, I think it can only work if uh, the members of the Indigenous Advisory Council themselves are there rallying and ensuring that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voices are heard across the spectrum. Um, you know, a, a, a a coalition government has form in these kinds of councils. We had the National Indigenous Council mm. that Warren was involved in um, uh, under the Howard government and uh, it remains to be seen uh, whether this advisory council can, I guess, get um, some more runs on the board um, and it's still unclear what the advisory council will do. We know that Warren Mundine has said we'll look specifically within the first six months about employment and, I guess, commercial outcomes and ensuring that all government spending and programs um, maximises those things. Um, but the detail, again, is very scant, and I would expect that, um, you know, uh, come Saturday, um, whoever is in power will be trying to get some runs on the boards, and in the Coalition's case, that's the direction they'll be taking. Let's bring in Justin Muhammad here. What do you make of this idea of the Advisory Council? What practical difference do you think it might make, do you hope it might make? Yeah, look, I think over the years we've seen... Um, Every government which comes into power, especially the more recent years, have um, worked, uh, you know, have had different ideas about how they can best communicate with um, Aboriginal people and get the input from Aboriginal people. And um, this particular advisory council, um, I have to agree with Kirsty, is that you know it, the the essence of this to make sure that it does work, um, it needs to ensure that it does speak with the experts out in the fields in, the, in a whole range of different areas. And in the National Aboriginal Community Control Health Organisation, where we're, our core business is health to Aboriginal people and communities, uh, we'd be thinking that, yep, yeah, if this is the way the, the government of the day wants to um, have advice and receive advice, that the, the advisory committee, that council really works it, tirelessly to get the understanding of what the issues are on the ground mm. and they speak to the people that have expert, the expertise. So um, at this stage, I mean, it, it's like everything, we've got to see how, how it does work. If that's the way the coalition sees its best fit, well then we are more, more than willing to work with that group and work with Warren to ensure that Aboriginal health it gets its, um, you know, its right um, its place there within that, yeah. on their Dan, agenda. Dan, let me ask you a question. Um, in terms of Indigenous politics in Australia, how is this advisory council going to change things? Will it be seen, will it be um, a pretty powerful body um, and will it change the dynamics amongst Indigenous leaders in Australia as to who's got the most influence? You'd have to think that it, that it could prove to be just as divisive as uh, former advisory councils uh, like that of the Howard government were. So, it, but, but it does have the opportunity because of Warren Mundine's obvious uh, political to cross it, being able to yeah, cross bipartisan that, that bipartisan yeah. uh, divide, that he, he could be able to bring something to this debate that hasn't happened before and essentially bringing both sides of those of the politics uh, together. And, and I guess that's uh, something that both Kirsty and Justin, I'd be interested to hear, is what's been your involvement of your respective organisations in this conversation yet? And do you see yourself having a seat at that table? Um, I might answer that first. Um, we haven't been involved in a conversation about the Indigenous Advisory Council. We um, have heard the pronouncements that obviously Tony Abbott has made. And I might say that they are in, um, I guess, um, in general, we support um, uh, um, 
a, a higher level of engagement with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Affairs. Both the ALP and the Coalition have said that they want to reinvigorate the relationship with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and there are a bunch of ways that you can do that and the first of those is making sure that you are speaking to as, as wide, I guess, a, a spectrum of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. The Congress um, would not see a role for itself in an advisory council. We're not an advisory body. We are a representative body uh, chosen by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and um, it's their interests that um, we're here rep to represent. Um, of course there's a level of engagement with government and we would have views about um, you know, uh, programs and spending etc but we don't see ourselves as a substitute or necessarily uh, or certainly um, not at this point a, a part of an advisory council. We are an ongoing organisation, we are here for the long term and um, you know, we'll work with a range of initiatives and bodies um, depending on you know, the, I guess the whim of the government of the day. Look, there's, there's a lot more we've got to get into here. I want to discuss the closing the gap issues, uh, which, you know, when we talk about governance uh, and changing advisory bodies and whatnot, at the end of the day, what's it going to mean on the ground in terms of practically improving health rates, um, uh, standards of living, life expectancy and these issues where there hasn't been clearly enough uh, progress. Uh, also the issue of um, constitutional recognition for Indigenous Australians, which is a big issue as well. We're going to have to take a quick break. For New Zealand viewers, New Zealand News is next for you. We'll continue this conversation for viewers in Australia. Stay with us. We'll continue our discussion now on Indigenous affairs, where it's been and perhaps where what's been missing on this during the election campaign. We're talking to our Indigenous Affairs correspondent Dan Borsha, as well as in Canberra, Justin Muhammad, the chair of the uh, National Aboriginal Community Controlled Health, and Kirsty Parker, the co-chair of the National Congress of Australia's First People. I want to look at some of the practical um, issues there for Indigenous Australians. And, you know, when we think about big election issues and where we're failing as a nation, it's all there to see when you look at the close the gap targets and, and where we haven't made enough improvement on things like literacy, numeracy, school retention, life expectancy, uh, infant mortality uh, and the rest of it. Um, what should the two parties be doing uh, on some of this stuff uh, during this election campaign? Kirsty, first to you. Um, I uh, would like to see both um, parties maintain their commitment to the Closing the Gap um, initiative. Certainly we've seen a, um, a very bipartisan approach to that campaign and that again is to be applauded. Um, the uh, Labor government has um, been very specific about its support. It's recently um, announced a couple of new initiatives, um, particularly with a view to developing some new Close the Gap targets around higher education, um, um, access to disability support and also a new target around justice and um, addressing the over-incarceration over of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. These things are to be welcomed and of course the coalition has um, uh, broadly supported the Closing the Gap strategy. It remains to be seen um, what their support will be for specific initiatives and strategies but um, they should be continuing that and certainly and Justin I'm sure can talk um, uh, more on this, um, you know, uh, health is a very big part of the Closing the Gap um, strategy on the part of government. We've recently seen um, the release of a new national Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health plan, and uh, you know, which I guess is a rough mud map. Um, but now it comes to the detail and really the hard work in implementing that plan. Yeah, Justin, just just on that plan, explain to us what it is, what a difference it's making, and what more could be done. Yeah, look, I think um, when we talk about closing the gap, and we've seen that there has been the targets, there's been the bipartisan support, a number of both sides of government have talked about their commitment to improving the health and education and employment of Aboriginal people. But the real core of this and the uh, key to this is how programs and how funding and the implementation of that rollout to frontline services and to communities and that's I think there's been some criticism over the years about how well that gets out to the communities and how well that is impacting them is there better ways to do that but I'd like to say that we need to continue the work that has been done and we need that continued support by the government but we also have to have a look at how and monitor and so we can evaluate what has worked well but what needs to be improved, what needs to be refined because we cannot do business as usual. And that is something which um, us in the health sector, I'm sure in education, employment and um, a whole range of other um, areas which impact on Aboriginal lives, we are saying as Aboriginal people we need to ensure the investment's there but the implementation is very important and how it is then monitored to ensure that 
government bodies, departments and also the people that receive the funds are doing the job as far as delivering the best quality of service to Aboriginal people in their communities. Justin, just how confident are you that on the big closing the gap indicator of the life expectancy uh, gap that it can actually be reached within a decade? Yeah, look, I mean, that, that is a very, that, that, that to me is the pinnacle of, well, this whole closing the gap campaign which started and, and got onto the, you know, the, um, into the, the staff rooms and in around the, um, the, the barbecues from, and in, in people's backyards. It's about closing the gap in life expectancy. We have seen very little change in the, the life expectancy gap being closed, but I think that we, we should be positive. There are certain trends which are starting to change in the right direction and that is starting from our early years, but we do realise it's going to take more than one term of government mm. and it's going to take possibly a generation and um, hopefully we can do it within a generation, but it does need the focus and it needs the commitment from everybody, not just Aboriginal people who are faced and delivering the services, but from the politicians and from the bureaucracy, which makes sure that Aboriginal affairs and in particular Aboriginal health stays front and centre of any political party, any government of the, of the day. And that's something which we're pushing for and some of the things where we've been a little bit concerned and disappointed for the lack of Aboriginal focus in, in both parties' um, election campaigns over the last couple of weeks. One of the other, Dan, um, uh, closing the gap areas, incarceration mm. rates. There are some out there with strong ideas on what, different, uh, what could be done differently. This um, justice reinvestment idea, just explain to us what that is and is either major party attracted to it? Well, not at this stage. We haven't seen any of the major parties really jumping uh, fully on board with it. It's, it's a policy of the Greens that came out of uh, a real policy trend in Canada over a number of years. And what it basically aims to do is direct money that would go into the jail and incarceration system mm -hmm. and put that into education beforehand, particularly with young people, as obviously that's where we're seeing uh, you know, the most increase in incarceration rates at, at around uh, 30... A, a young Indigenous person is more than 31 times more likely to end up in jail at the moment than a non-Indigenous. I mean, staggering number. Yeah, incredible. I mean, th this all comes in the frame of the Royal Commission that was held in the 90s, yet mm. since then we've seen up with those numbers increasing. In, in the last decade alone, the Indigenous incarceration rate has doubled to the point now where it was described in an interview I did recently yeah. as a cancer on, on the Australian population. And at the moment, we know that Indigenous people make up around 3% of the population, yet make up 14% of the jails. So you'd have to think that some of the detail that's in that justice reinvestment could be a different way of looking at incarceration, of spending money on young people in communities development before they get into that system. Now I also want to um, touch on the issue of constitutional recognition because at one point we were meant to be also having a referendum at this election on constitutional recognition of Indigenous Australians. It's clearly not happening at this election, but what is the what is the position of the parties on this now? Well, this is one of those uh, Indigenous issues that, that has really great bipartisan support. Everyone is on deck uh, saying that this is something that needs to happen. The real points of difference are in the time frame. We know that the Coalition has said that they'd like to, this to happen within a year. Uh, the Labor Party has said perhaps two years. The Greens are saying, let's just do this immediately. I mean, the great risk of this is that if it's done in a way where all Australians aren't on board and it fails, there may not be another chance to do it again. Uh, this is an issue that's come up just today. Christine Milne in the Press Club. Let's have a little bit of a listen to what she had to say. I want to say how pleased I am that as a result of the agreement that we signed with uh, former Prime Minister Gillard, that we have advanced the cause of Indigenous recognition in our constitution. And the Greens will work in this period of government with whoever forms government to make sure we do achieve Aboriginal recognition in the constitution and to get rid of racial discrimination from that document once and forever. I don't think that anything that Tony Abbott's saying in Indigenous affairs is to be believed. He's he talks big in Indigenous affairs, but you've got to look at the record of his party in government and the record of his party in opposition. This is the party that refused to say sorry to Indigenous people. This is the party that cut funding to Indigenous services. What Tony Abbott is doing uh, is ensuring that uh, Indigenous issues become a bipartisan issue and he's making it a personal crusade of his own. 
So Christine Milne there beginning at the press club today reaffirming the Greens position. Uh, we also heard there some comments from earlier in the election campaign of the Attorney General Mark Dreyfus as well as the Education Minister Christopher Pine being uh, quite scathing there by the Attorney General on just what we can expect to see from the uh, coalition should they win government. Uh, Kirsty, just how significant is constitutional reform? Oh, look, it's a, it's a very big issue, not just for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, but I would say for the whole nation. And, uh, you know, uh, people have variously described um, the uh, non-acknowledgement of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the Constitution, um, some racist provisions of the Constitution as an absolute blight um, on our country, and these are things that we need to get right. Um, as you said, uh, Dan, you know, this has been a very bipartisan process, and it, and it, and it certainly has been, and in some respects that's... Uh, um, you know, a, a good thing because it would be a real shame to see something like this politicised, you know, um, for constitutional recognition to become, uh, I guess, a political football. Um, but it is also important to ensure that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people themselves are comfortable with what, not what is uh, being proposed at the moment. We do have some recommendations from the expert panel, but to see some detail about uh, which direction um, the parties will go in, um, depending on who takes government. And I guess that's the, the real question will be in the detail that we, we see. Do you, do you expect that to be a point of contention between the major parties? Oh, look, it could be, but um, both uh, the uh, government, um, the Labor government and the Coalition have both said that they support um, acknowledgement of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people as the first Australians, and that's um, clearly to be applauded. Um, but uh, there are people that feel that that doesn't go fair enough, and certainly the recommendations of the expert panel on constitutional reform have recommended um, the repeal of particular provisions that um, allow for racial discrimination and um, it's the detail of those sorts of things that will I guess be most important um, so that we can make sure that uh, you know Australia's founding document actually is inclusive of all Australians and respectful of the particular place of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Justin just a final one to you then on this uh, you know it used to be said that you shouldn't focus so much on symbolic uh, matters you should focus more on practical matters when it comes to Indigenous Australians but how is this issue of constitutional recognition seen how important is it? Yeah, look, I think it's very important. I mean, the, the Constitution is something which um, a lot of things are based on and the foundation of a lot of policies which affect Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So I think this work around the cons Constitution is, is, is timely. Um, I'd hope to think that it doesn't become a political sort of football and, and get used like that because it's a very important and very crucial part of, um, of Australia, not only just Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, but of this nation. And it needs to be righted and it needs to be corrected now and um, if this is the time but we do need one of the key things I think we do need to have strong leadership on this and we can't afford to have maybe or when it needs to be strong so this nation can be led and I hope that um, whoever the uh, Prime Minister is after the weekend that the leadership will come from the Prime Minister and then of course the support from um, other people within this nation will be able to correct what the wrongs of this constitution has um, has has not said enough about our people, and but also is eradicating racism and that isolation which Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have faced for too many years in this country. Well, we're going to have to leave it there. Justin Muhammad, Kirsty Parker, and our very own Dan Borsha. Good to talk to all of you this afternoon. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Now we're going to take a quick break, then back with a look at how the markets wrapped up this afternoon. Stay with us.